So let's consider a constriction that looks like this. There's air, uh, an, an inviscid fluid flowing from the left. It flows through this uh, constriction and then it exits through this widened area off to the right. If we were to examine the flow, uh, the streamlines of the air through this, it would, we'd see horizontal streamlines on the left. It would flow para in parallel yeah, into the left and horizontal streamlines exiting to the right. And in the middle, what we would observe is the uh, fluid flowing uh, on the sides is constricted in this region. It flows together, flows through this narrow part, and then expands on the downstream edge of it. And as you can imagine, this constriction causes the speed of the air to increase as it flows from left to right. It's essentially taking all the air up here and cramming it into a real small surface area. What I want you to think about is how the pressure at this constriction compares to the upstream pressure and the downstream pressure at these wider areas. I want you to think about which pressure might be greater than the other pressure. To visualize this, I want you to consider an identical geometry in which we've drilled two holes and connected those holes by this U-shaped uh, pipe. And at the bottom of this pipe, it's filled with water. And at the moment, there is no air flowing through it. And the water, it seeks its own level. So the level on the left side is equal to the level on the right side. And I want you to think about what would happen once we start up the flow of air. So we've got air flow through it and these constricting streamlines. There's a fast, again, there's a fast velocity here and a relatively slow velocity on either end of it. And I want you to uh, take a moment and think about if you were to draw the, uh, l the position of the water down here after the flow has reached steady state, what would it look like? Would you expect that the liquid level on the right side at the constriction is lower than the liquid level on the left side? Would you expect that the level on the left side is, is actually lower than that on the right side? Now maybe you feel differently, but what I would expect, when I look at this, I think of all the, f uh, the fluid flowing through here. I guess at a glance I look at this and I think that the fluid uh, over here ought to be pushing down more on the water than the fluid on the left. But what's fascinating to me is that it, it's actually the opposite that happens. Uh, that there's a higher pressure here than there is here and the fluid flowing through it actually sucks up the liquid a little bit. So the high pressure here pushes down on the water and that causes the liquid level on the right side to be uh, actually higher than the liquid level on the left. To examine this, let's consider two points. There's point one at the wide entrance and point two at this constriction. As it turns out, if we pick two points on the same streamline, so here I'm picking point one, and eventually point one would flow into point two, or we could connect it with an arrow. If we pick two points along a streamline, and we make three major assumptions, you might want to write these down. If we assume that the fluid is inviscid, and this is a pretty big one, uh, if it's something like air, and the viscosity is essentially zero, and if we assume that the flow is steady, and finally we assume that the flow is incompressible, such that the density doesn't change between point one and point two, we can apply an equation known as Bernoulli's equation. And this equation is essentially a conservation of energy where it relates the pressure or flow energy, the kinetic energy, and the potential energy between points point one and two. And it says that the sum of the these three forms of energy have to equal the sum of the three forms of energy at point two. And if we examine the energy between points one and two, we'll find that the potential energy between those two points is the same because they're at the same level. And what we find is that the velocity at point two is greater because it's flowing through this constriction and what happens is the fluid gains kinetic energy at the expense of pressure or flow energy as it flows through and as a consequence of this equation and three assumptions we're making the fact that the velocity increases results in this decrease in the pressure. Let's demonstrate the use of this equation by working a quick example problem in which the pressure is measured at point one and point two and the pressure at point one is 10 kilopascal greater than the pressure at point two. And we want to know uh, what the speed is at point two if the cross-sectional area at this point is one-fifth the cross-sectional area at point one. So let's make some pretty big assumptions and to apply this equation. Let's see if they check. The first assumption that we need to make is that the uh, fluid is inviscid. So we're dealing with air, the viscosity of air is, is relatively low and we're dealing with, uh, probably dealing with some pretty big velocities. So the assumption that the fluid is inviscid is probably pretty good. And the next major assumption we're making is that the flow is incompressible. And we've got a pressure drop of 10 kilopascal 
and provided the absolute pressure is big enough, a, cha a pressure change of 10 kilopascal won't be enough to change the, uh, the density or the volume of air very much as it flows through the channel. And then the, the last assumption we'll make is that the flow is steady, which is reason definitely reasonable in this case. Nothing is, is changing with respect to time. So since those, those uh, assumptions check out, we can justify the use of Bernoulli's equation. And what we need to figure out in this problem is how much the velocity increases between points 1 and points 2. So because the fluid is incompressible, the volumetric flow rate of air at point 1 is equal to the volumetric flow rate of air at point 2. So we can write that the velocity at point 2 multiplied by its cross-sectional area is equal to the velocity at point 1 times its cross-sectional area. And we can solve for the cross-sectional area. A2 is equal to one-fifth that of A1. And with these two equations, we can deduce that the velocity at point 1 is one-fifth that the velocity at point 2. So the, the speed at point 2 is five times greater than the speed at point 1. And if I make the substitution, I've got P1 plus one-half rho times one-fifth V2 squared is equal to P2 plus one-half rho V2 squared. And double-check my algebra, but when I solve for V2, I get the pressure difference divided by uh, this term, this difference, one-half minus one over 50 times rho, and uh, take the square root of that, and I solve for V2. So if I plug numbers in with units, what I come up with is 10,000 pascal divided by this ratio, 1 half minus 1 over 50 times rho, which is 1 kilogram per cubic meter. I didn't specify the density in the problem statement, but 1 kilogram per cubic meter is reasonable for air. And then take the square root of this whole thing. And what I, could, I should come up with is something, we'd expect something in terms of meters per second. And if I examine it, I was careful to, to multiply 10 kilopascal by a factor of 1,000. And a pascal, if I say 1 pascal is equal to 1 newton per square meter, it's also equal to 1 kilogram per meter second squared. So within the square root, I've got uh, in the denominator 1 kilogram per meter second squared. And in the uh, or in the numerator, kilogram per meter second squared. The denominator, I've got density. So I've inverted, I've got meters squared, meters, or cubic meters per kilogram. The kilograms cancel out, and I'm left with meters squared per second squared. And taking the square root of that, sure enough, I get uh, dimensions or units of meters per second, as we'd expect. And finally, making the calculation, I'm left with, to two significant figures, 140 meters per second.